Hi, I'm Elisa Parker. This is the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. We're based in downtown Nevada City and also Grass Valley, California. You might also catch part of Wild and Scenic when we go on tour across the country. It's been an incredible day so far. So many fantastic and really just phenomenal everyday action heroes that are <laughs> making change and then those who are capturing the stories, right? These are the stories that need to be told. Yeah. Right, Peter? But we don't sure. hear from them. I'm excited to have Peter Beck here with us. He has two films here at Wild and Scenic. Peter was mentioning earlier, he said, a lot of films at Wild and Scenic, but this is the first time you're here physically. Yeah. My wife and I last night, we were driving in, smelling the pine. Yes. And wondering, why have we not come here before? Why have you not come here? Why do you not live here? Yeah, it is beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah. So your two films screening this year are A Fence and uh, a Fence and an Owner mm -hmm. and During the Drought. So yep. both involve, like, what, farming. Grazing. Grazing. Yeah, okay, cattle grazing. Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's talk mm -hmm. about A Fence and an Owner. Okay. So that's in uh, Corona, New Mexico, the Ranny Ranch. And... Their dad died who bought the ranch in the late 60s and they wanted to change the way they were managing it. They wanted to do a more um, intensive grazing to replicate the way herds used to move across the Great Plains. And their manager, the man who was actually running the cattle, uh, he didn't want to do it because he didn't think it was going to work. As a matter of fact, he knew it wasn't going to work. Um, and they said, well, we really want you to stay. We really want you to work here, but this is what's going to happen. So he. He kind of just bit the bullet and did it and was just blown away that they were in the beginning of a 15-year drought and the way they changed their management actually brought up plants that they had never seen before. You're kidding me. No. Like, and it brought up plants that got them through the drought and their neighbors didn't have those plants. It's, so they've got an enormous diversity of forage that they didn't have when they were grazing conventionally. Yeah, so what does that mean then? What did they do differently regarding the grazing with the cattle? Well, they've got 20,000 acres and they used to have their animals roaming. It could take six months to find them all. And what you do is you, you bring all your herd into one herd. You bring all your animals into one herd. So then that's a huge time saver just right there. You know where they are. And they made smaller paddocks and they moved the animals around in the paddocks. And so that replicates the way bison used to move across the Great Plains. And so the animals hit an area hard. They tramp down what they don't eat. They eat a lot, manure and urine and all that stuff. So it's a whole lot of nutrients from the animals and action and chomping. And then they leave and that's how all the grasses want to be handled. That's how they evolved. And so the photosynthesis just takes off and the root depth just takes off. And what's happening is a lot of seeds that are just in the soil are expressing themselves now. They, they can live for a hundred years. Wow. And so they're seeing plants in places all over the country that are doing a form of this type of grazing. What is the grazing called? Amp grazing. Amp grazing. Is adaptive this Adaptive multi-paddock grazing. Okay, is this something that's taking off? Like, I mean, what, as far as um, taking a, off, a, be, a, pra, a best practice? It's happening. Um, like, how come farm, more farmers aren't doing this? Well, farmers are doing this, and a lot of them, Alan Williams is a friend of ours and a colleague of ours, and he teaches this. And he was on the road 280 days last year giving workshops to four and five hundred people at a time. Because it's sustainable for the farmers, especially when we are in situations of drought, which yeah. we are in California. It's we more have resilient. been right, yeah. more resilient. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. And then t um, tell me about your film during the drought. So during the drought is a similar story where a farmer, um, Michael Thompson in sort of north central Kansas, he had already been doing uh, no-till with cover crop for crops and then grazing that with his animals giving himself another way to make money and the drought hit and all his neighbors had to sell off their animals but he didn't because his soils were so rich by the point the drought hit in 2011 and 2012 that he was producing forage when his neighbors weren't and his neighbors know it's better but they I don't want to change. And so this, this, this sense of I don't want to change or you're telling me my dad and grandfather did it wrong, that, that factor is, or I don't want people talking about me in the bar on Saturday nights, that's a real factor to keep people from changing. But we figure we just tell as many stories as we can all over the country and, and just keep giving information out, you know, and just hope it 
catches on. It is catching on. It's just a question of what's the scale. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so was it just by accident that the two films that you were working on recently were around grazing and, and the drought? No, we've got about eight films on this now. Wow. Yeah, and so Soil Carbon Cowboys played here a few years ago. 100,000 Beating Hearts played here, I believe, last year. These two films, and we've got four others. And so on, on our site that we're building, it's called SoilCarbonCowboys.com. All eight are up, and then we're building more. So we, we want to tell these stories, because everyone says, yeah, but it won't work in my state, or it won't work in my county. Or literally, with Michael Thompson, his neighbor, just across, there is no fence. You could see how his soil is so much more robust. They planted at the exact same time. They did a crop before it at the exact same time. And his neighbor says, well, yeah, but you got more rain than I did. Right? You're like, unlikely, unlikely. That's amazing. Are you a farmer yourself? No. So where does your own interest and passion stem from around this? Climate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking for solutions to climate change. So the first film that we had here was called Carbon Nation. That would have been here in 2010 or 2011. Um, that was a film about looking for solutions to climate change in any way we could, from clean energy to land use to stewardship to anything. And we found that land was the most potent way to draw down carbon, so I started focusing on that, and then grazing seemed to be the biggest bang for the buck, so I started focusing on that. But there's so many questions about this type of grazing, so many questions about is it this, is it that, can you really build soil that fast, and all the conventional science community thinks it's impossible, but yet they don't go to these farms to right. check it out. So we've put together a, a, a large team, 18 scientists together, to actually do research on these farms. And uh, we actually have a really great matching grant from McDonald's for $4.5 From McDonald's? From McDonald's. Interesting. Where does, where does McDonald's uh, beef come from? Primarily? All over. All over? Yeah, I don't think mm -hmm. there's a primary. I think So that's interesting. McDonald's yeah. is investing in this. Yeah. Um, my pitch to them was, what if you can help the land and help the farmer and actually your main product be healthier, you know? Right. And, and so they're looking, they like the idea of their main product, the hamburger, being produced in a regenerative way. They, they think there's only good with that. That is good news, Peter. Yeah. That's very good news. My last question is, um, so our theme is groundswell, mm -hmm. right? So yep. this convergence and rising up and yep. coming together. What does that mean to you personally right now? Um, especially given everything this year that has been happening. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I really am focused on, on the regenerative ag thing, and, and I do think that critical mass is coming. I think we're in this sort of bubbling up, right? And so when I think of groundswell, that's what I think of it. It, it, it starts from the ground, and this is literally, I'll tell you, um, I would bet that most of the farmers that I film and I vote differently. I would bet a lot of money on that. Yet when we get together, we don't talk politics, we talk soil. And I think soil is a lot more important than politics. And so I'm always looking for common ground. That's what we, that's what we were looking for. Literally. It's literally, right? it's literally the ground. Mm -hmm. That's common ground. Seeking common ground. Thanks so much, yeah. Peter Bick. The films are Thanks, a fence and an owner and during the drought, and they're screening here at Wild and Scenic. Um, and where, again, can people go to get more information about this work that you're doing? Yeah, uh, SoilCarbonCowboys.com. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much. I'm Elisa Parker. It's the Wild and Scenic Film Fest. We are hanging out here at Nevada City Winery in the festival. We'll be here tomorrow as well. Thanks so much for joining us.